We've got a very few minutes tonight to talk about how do you study the Bible. I want to allow you to look over my shoulder as I study the Bible. Now the way we're going to do this, we're going to put a passage of Scripture open. Get your Bible out and look at Galatians chapter 1, those first seven verses. We're not going to be able to cover all of them tonight. In fact, knowing that uh, you'll spend a lot of time on each of the verses, I've already cut out three of the verses so, uh, from that and we'll not be talking about those. How do you study the Bible? I would suggest if I were going to study the book of Galatians, I'd read it through again and again and again. Not just one time. I'd read it out loud so I'd hear myself read it. When you read it out loud, it sounds different from when you're just mentally looking at words and not calling them. Now, if I made an assumption that you knew the book of Galatians and that you had read it through somewhat, then I want you to help, I, I want to show you the way that I study. Uh, David is particularly good at this. David and I do much the same thing, and that is we print out the passage. We put it in uh, sometimes a double space and everything so that we're able underneath that to write the notes that we're going to talk about. Now, we're not going to write the notes tonight. We're not going to write these on the screen, but let's, but let's, let, let, let's, uh, uh, let's, let's, get, let's get to the text. I hope you're able to see the text well enough and read it uh, well enough. Here's how you begin. You read it, and then you begin, after you've got a bird's eye view of the book, you sit down and you, write, and you read it from a worm's eye view of the book. And that's to look at every word. And that's the kind of thing that we do and your life will be enriched because God chose every word of the Bible. Now, this is, and you've got to put this in its context, it is an epistle. It is a letter that Paul writes. And so if I were going to study this and if you were looking over my shoulder, I'd write down the word Paul. I used to do this on those legal pads to do it, that kind of thing. That's before the days of computer. And I'd just write down Paul. What do you know about Paul? And you're going to study it. You'd better remember who he is and all that he's done. You know what city he's from? Do you know who his teacher was? Do you know who taught Paul the Bible? Do you know who, do you know who taught him the gospel? And do you know who the man who baptized him? You know who, do you know that? And so if you're going to know this book, you've got to know about it. And so you could just begin by writing what you know. And then you could go and find out other things. For example, some of those things that I might have mentioned. Where, where did he attend school? Who was his teacher? And that type of thing. If you don't know that, then you could do, look up, just look up the, the word Paul in a concordance, and you'd be able to learn all this. Now, fortunately, there's the Internet. And so you can just type in the life of Paul and, and, and you can gain a lot of that information. But let me caution you, when you get to the internet, don't you believe everything you've read. And make sure that the things that are stated are not just some legend some individual has thought up. For example, when he was beheaded, uh, you can read this on the internet, when he was beheaded uh, there in Rome, his head bounced three times and three springs of water just, just, just sprang out of the, sprang out of the, uh, the, the concrete, whatever those rocks that, that, that was there. That's legend. That's not fact. And so when you get to the internet, be aware of that. Paul, look at the next statement, Paul, an apostle. So you look at that. What is an apostle? Do you know the definition of an apostle? You might want, if you do not know, you might want to write down Luke chapter 6 and verse 13. Uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 13 says that he called his disciples to him, and from them he selected 12 apostles. Still haven't defined what an apostle is, but now all of a sudden you're going to study this? You want to look over my shoulder? What is the difference in a disciple and, a, and an apostle? And so you just put that note there. And sometimes I just put notes, look up later or check to find this because so, so many things will be coming to your mind. Paul, an apostle. What's a disciple? Well, 
He is one who has been disciplined. He's an individual who's a student. That's what's involved in it. And so there were those individuals who were learners. They were individuals that Jesus was teaching. And so he calls, he calls them together, and from them he picks out 12 men. You read the parallel in Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 10, and the Bible said, and he sent them. You know what an apostle is? An apostle is one sent. That's the Greek word. And so if you don't know what an apostle is, just put an apostle equals, and then not one C-E-N-T, not equals one penny, but an apostle equals one cent. Now then, as you begin looking at the text, what's the next thing you notice? I don't know if you can see on the screen that the parentheses are highlighted. What are parentheses all about? What's a parenthetical expression? A parenthesis are used whenever you're talking along and there's something you want to say. It's not really in tune with exactly what you need to say, but it is really important that it be said important enough that you will put it in parentheses. And so you can read a sentence and that which is in parentheses, you can leave it out and, and it, will have, it will have a similar meaning to it. Look on the screen. Paul, an apostle, and all the brethren who are with me unto the churches of Galatia. You see, you take out that parenthetical expression. But wait a minute. Why is it there? Go back and look, look at the text and look at what's inside the parenthesis. I am an apostle, not not an apostle that is made an apostle of men or by men. And you see the word men? And then look at the next word, man. Not by a group of men, nor by any man. What's he doing? Well, if you've read this book through several times, you're going to find one of the problems that he addresses in the, in the book of Galatians is there are folks who didn't believe he was an apostle. And so Paul begins right at the very beginning by saying, Paul, an apostle. That's the issue right there. I'm writing to you, and I have apostolic authority. And I want you to know I am an apostle. I'm not some, some, uh, a leader that some men chose me to be an apostle, like Jesus selected the, the 12 apostles from among the disciples. I am an apostle that was selected by Jesus. It was not by a group of men, but I am, an, I am an apostle, not by man, not by men, neither by man, but by, uh, but look at the word but. What does that mean? Well, all of a sudden that's put in contrast to what, what has been said before. And so as you read this text, I am going to, uh, to spend, uh, you know, next week going to such and such a place, but I won't be there the whole week. You see how that's put in contrast? And so he says, I am an apostle, not by some man, but by Jesus. I'm an apostle by Jesus. What do you know about Jesus? Well, you need to understand what he is, but you have the word Jesus, and right after it, you have the word Christ. I don't know, uh, David, uh, uh, David, uh, David Bonds, could you, you listen to me? I want to tell you something. You hear Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. I grew up in the church. Like you're growing up in the church, and like everybody I knew had a first name and a last name, I had, you know, theologically figured out his name, his last name is Christ. Jesus Christ. You know, Dan Jenkins, Jesus Christ. That's who he is. David, that is not what he was. That's not his last name. That is what he is. Now, if you don't know what Christ is, then you might ought to spend time. You want to look over my shoulder? It's a Greek word. You know, do, you know, do you know the Hebrew word? Do you know the Old Testament word for Christ? It's Messiah. You know the English word defining Messiah and Christ? It's the word anointed. You're looking over my shoulder, and I'm trying to figure out what this book is all about. And Paul says, look, I am an apostle, not by some man, but Jesus the Messiah has made me to be an apostle. 
And then he says, not but, but by Jesus Christ. And then he said, and then look at this, and. It's so easy to overlook this word and, but an and, the word and is a coordinate conjunction that ties two things together. I am an apostle by Christ and by God. And then he talks about the attribute of God, and that, that is that he is the Father. I am, I am an apostle of Jesus Christ by, by, Jesus, by, by Jesus, made so by Jesus, and by God the Father. You're trying to figure out what this verse is all about? I'm telling you, you will not read the book of Galatians and, and do all of your studying in, in, uh, you know, in a day's time. You've got to look at it and look at every word in it and see the impact of it. I am not an apostle by some man. I'm not an apostle but by some group of men. It is Jesus, the Messiah. It's, the, it's God the Father. Now that has import and an importance later in the book but when these folks received the word, when you write a, write a letter, do you not, uh, you know, get to the point really quick? Do you not state really the reason? I need to talk to you about. That's the introduction. And so Paul does that very sort of, this very same thing. Paul and an apostle, not by men, nor by a group of men. I am an apostle made so by, by, by God the Father and then the, he is the one uh, who raised him from the dead. Make no, make no comments from that, but I hope you understand who the he and who the him is in that verse. And probably in my notes, I would just put who, who raised him from the dead. I'd put the who and I'd identify that as God, and I would put him and identify that as Jesus. Now, when I've done all of that, I have superficially, listen, superficially studied the first verse. Now, you can go back and you can do all kinds of other kinds of studies and add to this. You can do cross-references, like I mentioned Luke chapter 6 and verse 13 to help define what an apostle is. You can put other things that are in there and then, uh, and, and then, then you get to this. Now then, you get to the next verse and he says, I am an apostle by Jesus Christ and all the brethren who are, who are with me. And that's the way they wrote letters. They signed the letters at the beginning. What you do if you get a letter and you're not sure who it's from, you look at the end of the letter to see who it's from. And so he says, Paul says, this is a letter not just from me, but it is a letter from all of the brethren. Does that not imply that they would know who, what brethren were with Paul whenever he wrote this letter? I, absolutely. Uh, you know. And so he says, all of the brethren who are with me, and we send it, and then he says, uh, unto, that's a part of the letter, unto the churches. I don't know if you can see what's highlighted on the screen, but many, many times as I study the Bible, when I see that plural nature that's there. It's not the church of Galatia. It's the churches of Galatia. And, and you, you begin looking at it. Where on earth is Galatia? You want to look over my shoulder and, and try to figure that out? You can do it. All you got to do is to uh, look up. You got those maps in the back of your Bible? What, you know, would, would that help you to know who the churches, where the churches of, of Galatia are? And you need to look at it. They, it. That area is called Galatia because the people that, uh, that settled in that area were, were, were Gauls. I believe that's from, is that France or Spain? Which is it? It's Spain? Okay. They, uh, uh, but, but, you know, they, they're the ones who transported over into that area. That's where they came from. That's how the name got there. Now the, there's a political Galatia and there is an area Galatia. And so you'd, you'd, you'd learn, learn that. Well, where on earth would I learn that? Just read books, look up in good Bible dictionaries, and they will discuss this. It's my firm conviction that Galatia included Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. What do you know about Lystra and Derbe? 
Oh, that's, that's where Lois and Eunice and Timothy were. And so Paul has established the churches in Galatia. And he writes a letter back, not to a single congregation, but to multiple churches in Galatia. Now, having done that, he says in the next part, I am amazed. I am amazed at what has happened in this place. I marvel when he says this. I marvel, he says, that, that you are so soon removed from him that called you. I underline the word soon. Why? It happened so amazingly quick, and it shows you how rapidly somebody can turn away from God. Here were these people who'd left Judaism and people who'd left paganism, and Paul writes this letter back because what's happened? Something has developed there, and it's happened in a hurry. But look at it again. Look at the next slide, and I've underlined the word so. It's not just, well, it happened soon. It happened so soon. Well, I think that's a stopping place. Our time is up. And I uh, wanted to go through the rest of this, of this paragraph. But let me tell you, if this is of any profit to you, let me know we might continue this study in another Sunday night just to show you how to study the Bible. Because I've, one of the things that I've done is people that I, whom I greatly respect and how they knew the Bible, I said, how do you know the Bible so much? I remember asking Johnny Ramsey, who, could, who has preached many years ago in this congregation, Johnny, how do you study the Bible? And he would not tell me how he studied the Bible. And uh, I finally got him to tell me how he studied the Bible. And, and uh, I've decided Johnny is crazy because he and I studied the Bible in much the same way. Uh, but it was just amazing the answer he gave to me. He said, I will start. I'm going to study the book of Jeremiah. And I'll get about three words into Jeremiah, and there's another topic, and I just get, I forget that other, uh, that I'm studying Jeremiah, and I'll take off and study this, and I'll study that, and I'll study that, and one topic leads to another. Now, if you're OCD, you can't do that. But, if, but you know, if, if your mind is, is not, uh, is a mind that just jumps all over the place, that's the way Johnny knew the Bible. That's a way to study the Bible. Brother Franklin Camp had such an impact in my life. Brother Camp, how did you study the Bible? I heard him first, first time I ever heard him preach. I was a student at Lipscomb, and he, he and Willard Collins, who was the vice president and later president of, of, of Lipscomb, uh, were roommates when they went to Christian colleges together. And uh, uh, that's when I learned that Brother Camp got up and, you know, four o'clock in the morning and studied the Bible six hours every day. Can you imagine doing that? Yet that is an astounding thing. So Ron Coleman and I, when we heard that, we said, we'd like to know the Bible like Brother Camp. So we're still students here at Lipscomb, so let's just plan to get up early. And so uh, we didn't get up at, you know, and start at six. It was probably, you know, a little bit after six. And I think it lasted about two weeks, and then we went back to sleeping in like we used to do. Uh, how do you study the Bible? Those individuals who spent many hours studying the Bible are the people that know the Bible. Let me encourage you, don't superficially study the Bible. Read it, read it thoroughly, but get down and to see the treasures that God has placed in individual words and I hope that what we've done tonight helps you to understand why David says that word is in the present tense and it's continuous. You know, how do you get that? Well, there's a way even without knowing Greek, you can find out the tense of that. You do it, on, do it uh, very easy using Bible programs and everything. But uh, it, uh, you know, it's just it, 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 you do it. And then when you look at the present tense, what does it mean? And David is so powerful in saying, this is an ongoing action. That's the present tense. And so we can get in this and go deeper into this. And 
with the use of the internet and Bible programs, you can look up the Greek word itself and see how that Greek word is used elsewhere in the Bible. Without knowing a single word of Greek, if you've got a Bible program that has Strong's numbers in it, you can look up and see how that word is used elsewhere. And so David sometimes will say, this word is the same word that appears over here, and over here it's translated this way. Why do you do that? It's to give us a better understanding of that word in the first place because light is shed on by the way it is found in the second place. That's enough for tonight. Let's get to this time of singing of an invitation song because it may be that you've decided to give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you have, you need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins, to confess your faith in Jesus, and to be baptized for the remission of sins. That's not some plan of salvation that some man thought up. It's not some dogma thought up by some group of men. It is from Jesus Christ himself, and it's recorded by those individuals who were inspired and given their message by Jesus. That's his plan of your salvation. If you've never believed in Jesus and been baptized, you could be baptized this very night. That's what the song of invitation is about. It's an invitation that says Jesus wants you to come to him and the church will join its voice together to remind you of the invitation of Jesus. We want you to come if, you're, if, you're, if you've never become a Christian or if you're a wayward Christian, Christian and you've wandered away, you could extend, you could come and respond to the invitation tonight and let the church pray for you. How can we help you go to heaven? Won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing. Will you come?